Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Daniel Bragg and I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Bragg Capital Management. And in this video, I'm going to show you a simple way that you could have almost doubled your stock market returns over the past five years. And the only thing you needed to do was make four investment decisions over that same five year period of time. No day trading, no staring at your computer screens all day long, just a simple process that I believe anyone can replicate and implement for themselves. But the first thing we're going to talk about today is how I developed the idea of a quality compounder stock. And then after that, I'm going to identify the five characteristics that I look for to determine if a business has a durable competitive advantage and has the potential to become a quality compounder stock. And then after that, I'll uncover our first quality compounder stock and we'll back test its performance over the past five years uh, based on the rules that I've created with the quality compounder method. And then we'll be able to bring out the gloves and see which strategy would win over that period of time, index investing or the quality compounder method. So my promise to you is by the end of this video, you're going to know what to buy and when to buy with as little risk of loss as possible. But before I begin, I just want you to let you know just how much I enjoy putting all this content out for you. And I really hope it can help you become a better investor. So if you want me to keep creating content like this for you all, all I ask you to do is a couple things to show your support for the channel. So please do me a favor and hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out. And also in the comments below, let me know what stocks you'd like me to do a video on so I can do my research and determine if they have the characteristics of a quality compounder stock. And if it does, I can back test them to see how they would perform if I plug them into the quality compounder method. So that being said, uh, today we're going to talk about our first quality compounder stock. Uh, but before we do that, let's briefly talk about how I developed the idea of what a quality compounder stock is. So when Warren Buffett was working with Benjamin Graham, Graham was always looking for stocks that were trading 50% the, below the value of the total assets of the company. He'd call it buying a dollar for 50 cents. But when he was doing this, he'd do very little research into the economics of the business that he was buying. And the problem with this was there would be a fair number of these businesses that he'd buy that had just terrible business prospects and they'd end up going bankrupt and the stock would go to zero. So he had to have a widely diversified portfolio. But when Buffett was working for him, what he discovered was that a few of these businesses had really good prospects for growth and he would see that some of these stocks would go on to 10x and even in some cases 100x in value. But unfortunately because Graham had this rule that he would sell the stock as soon as it had gone up 50%, uh, he would miss out on all these massive gains. So what Buffett realized was that he could outperform his mentor uh, by studying and identifying the characteristics that made these companies such amazing long-term investments. So he started combing through the financial statements of these businesses so he could identify other businesses with these same traits in the future. And one of the main things that he discovered was that these businesses all benefited from some sort of competitive advantage that created monopoly-like economics that made it very hard for the competitors to gain any advantage. And if this competitive advantage was durable and the business had a long runway of growth, then these stocks would outperform over a very long period of time. It also meant that if he was able to purchase the stock at a fair price with a decent margin of safety, it was very unlikely that these companies would ever go bankrupt and that would protect himself and his clients from any permanent loss of capital. And another benefit would be that since these businesses had such great long-term prospects, he could buy them and let them compound year after year without paying any taxes along the way. Graham, on the other hand, would be paying taxes every time he sold his stocks when they went up 50% or more. So when I was developing the quality compounder method, I knew that these businesses with this durable competitive competitive advantage would plug into the strategy very well. So I did what Buffett did and I started to study the ways to identify these characteristics of these companies that had this competitive advantage. And once I found them, I would back test them to see how they would have performed in the past if they were plugged into my method. So first, let's talk about how we identify the characteristics of a company with a durable competitive advantage and where to find this information. So the place that I gather this information is a website called gurufocus.com. A link to a seven day free trial is in the description. And the reason why I use this website is it has 30 years of financial data organized in a very easy to use format and it eliminates the tedious task of downloading data into Excel which is probably my least favorite thing to do. Plus they have filters where you can see the stocks of your favorite investors uh, and what they're buying in real time. But for this video, we're gonna use it to identify the characteristics of a company with a durable competitive advantage. So the characteristics that I'm looking for as follows. So number one is operating margin. So when I was a kid, my parents saw video rental stores popping up all around our neighborhood. And since my father was an engineer, he did the math on the economics of the video rental business 
and they decided to open one up with my mom and my aunt and uncle as partners. And for many years, the business brought our family extra income. Uh, we were all able to get jobs, all the kids in the family, and it was a ton of fun. I actually remember calculating the numbers, how, how many hours I'd need to work uh, so I could buy a new surfboard. But eventually, the small mom and pop shops started to saturate the community, and everyone uh, started to compete on price, slowly, slowly driving down the profitability of the shop. And then Blockbuster came in, cutting the prices even lower, uh, which pretty much forced all the mom and pop shops to close. It was a sad time for my family because we were really accustomed to the relationships we built with our customers and within the community. And unfortunately, this is an example of being in a business without a durable competitive advantage and how important it is to own a business that can defend its profit margin. So I guess we got the last laugh because Netflix was eventually born and they pretty much crushed Blockbuster with better service movies at a simple affordable price and brick and mortar video rentals was definitely a thing of the past. So when I'm trying to identify a business with a durable competitive advantage, I like to look at the operating margins of the business, which is the total revenue of the company divided by normal operating costs like cost of goods sold, selling and general administrative expenses. And the reason why I'm looking at these numbers is because not only do I want to see good margins in the business, but I also want to see a consistency in those margins over a five to 10 year period of time. Time. because if that margin is high it's sustainable but most importantly it's if it's defensible then we can make the case that the business has some sort of competitive advantage uh, that makes it very hard for other businesses to compete with it on the other hand if we see a business with high operating margins that are slowly declining over time then we know that competitors have come into the space and they're lowering their prices or taking share away from the business and we want to do our best to, to avoid that so what I'm generally looking for uh, in operating margin is, is above 30 uh, percent but this can vary depending on the industry and for this example we're looking at MasterCard uh, which is in the credit services business and so if we go to gurufocus.com and we, we go to the 30-year summary and scroll down to the operating margin uh, you can see that MasterCard's operating margins over the last 10 years has averaged about 54%, which is phenomenal. You can also see that their operating margin is expanding, showing that they have a strong competitive advantage and a great management team in place that's keeping expenses in check. And then if you look at how they stack up in their industry, you'll see that they're at the top of their class, although Visa has a higher operating margin at 65%. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily look at this as a negative because Visa is a larger company, which in turn has more operational leverage. And this actually might be giving us some in insight as to where MasterCard's operating margins are, are going in the future. So based on the historical operating margins, MasterCard would definitely check the box as a company with a durable competitive advantage. So the second characteristic I like to look at is revenue growth. So we can't expect to see a company with a competitive advantage to have zero or negative growth in revenues. So a big characteristic that I look for in a company is one that has consistent revenue growth over a five to 10 year period of time. And if I see this continued growth rate between 10 and 20%, I can feel confident that the company is defending and growing its position in the market. It also shows that new players are having issues competing and taking share. And when we look at MasterCard's revenue growth rate over five years, the average growth rate is 16.5% and then over 10 years it's about 15.3%, showing that they, they have steady revenue growth rate over time, and, and that's something that I absolutely love to see. The third characteristic I like to look at is EPS growth. So as shareholders, we're entitled to the future earnings of the company, so it's important that we're seeing consistent growth in earnings per share, or EPS. In MasterCard EPS over both a five and 10 year period uh, stands consistent at 19 and a half percent, showing that this business can consistently grow revenues and earnings per share over a long period of time. And we always want to see steady growth without big swings up or down in EPS numbers. So the fourth characteristic that I like to look at is retained earnings growth. Uh, so now that we've discovered that MasterCard is a basically a money printing machine, uh, we want to see how much of these profits are retained in the company to, to continue the growth of the company. And that rate of growth of retained earnings is a good indicator of whether it's benefiting from a competitive advantage. Obviously, if it loses money, it's a negative to retained earnings, and we don't ever want to see that. So basically, a business can do three things with its earnings. If it makes money, it can pay out dividends, buy back stock, or reinvest its earnings into the growth of the company. So the first use of earnings is paying out dividends, and I absolutely hate dividends because first and foremost, it's an admission from management that they can invest back into the business and improve the growth of the company. A business that pays big dividends usually shows slow linear growth that might even be declining, and then a company that pays little or no dividend can show exponential growth that looks more like a hockey stick. And because of this, you shouldn't plan on this type of stock compounding your money very quickly over time. Second, dividends are also very tax inefficient for the company and yourself, and if you're like me, I hate paying taxes. So the second use of earnings 
earnings is, is stock buybacks. And I don't mind these as much, but again, it's also an admission. You can't find a good use of your profits within the business. But I do like them better than dividends because as they buy back shares, that means EPS grows and I get a bigger share of those earnings uh, because there's now less outstanding shares, which should lead to a higher share price uh, without any taxes in between. Now, the third use of earnings is my favorite, and this is what made Warren Buffett super rich. So if a company can retain its earnings and they're profitably put to use, they can greatly improve the long-term economics of the business. Uh, when Warren Buffett took over Berkshire Hathaway, he immediately suspended the dividend of the company so he could retain the earnings and use that money to invest in other highly profitable business. And by doing so, Berkshire's uh, shareholder equity grew from $19 a share in 1965 to 78000 in 2007. And the way he did this was by taking every dollar of retained earnings and putting it to use in other businesses that would increase the value of each dollar year after year. So the question you'd have to ask yourself is, would you rather have a dollar now in dividends and pay the taxes on that dollar or keep that dollar in the business and have it grow to two dollars five years from now or four dollars ten years from now? I personally would prefer that the company keeps that dollar in the business and helps that business grow even further because this is how a company grows its stock price and your net worth over a long period of time. In this case, MasterCard has used all three. It has a very small dividend. It's always increasing its stock buybacks and it's consistently grown its retained earnings uh, to fuel its future growth. And as you can see from the chart here, MasterCard retained earnings has been growing year over year uh, throughout its history. Now the fifth characteristic I like to look at is return on equity. So now that we've determined that the company is growing its retained earnings and that's what we want to see, we have to look at the return the company's management is getting on that money. So the return on equity percent shows how well the company invests these funds to generate earnings growth. We don't want to see a management team that's retaining earnings only to see them get a negative or low percentage return on those earnings. So so an ROE percent between 15 and 20 percent is what we're looking for and, and are considered desirable. MasterCard's annualized return on equity is massive and for the quarter that ended uh, June 2020, it was almost 96 percent. And as you can see from the chart, the company's ROE has consistently improved year over year. And this shows that MasterCard is in a business that has very high growth opportunities and based on their returns versus their peers, you can see that the, their management team is crushing the rest of the competition. So now that we've gone over the five characteristics that I look for in a business with a durable competitive advantage, one being operating margin, two being revenue growth rate, three being EPS growth rate, four being growth of retained earnings, and then five being return on equity. Uh, based on the data, I would conclude that MasterCard is a business that has a durable competitive advantage. And now that we've made it through that filter, let's back test MasterCard's performance if it was plugged into the quality compounder method. So let's quickly review the rules of the quality compounder method. The first rule is that all new capital, including weekly or monthly scheduled deposits, are invested into an S&P index fund. And this rule stays constant even when the VIX is elevated above 35. Second rule is when the VIX closes above 35, we're gonna use 20 to 30% margin to purchase the quality compounder stock, which in this case is MasterCard. Third rule is when the VIX stays elevated above 35, we're gonna use an additional 10% of margin to purchase the quality compounder stock. Fourth rule is total leverage in the portfolio should stay below 50%. So to make things simple, we're gonna start off with a $100,000 portfolio, holding 588 shares of the SPY at $170 a share, purchased on August 25th, 2015. Now the first step is to plot out the moments over the past five years where the VIX closed above 35. And as you can see from this chart, there were four moments during this period where the VIX closed above 35. And that first occurrence was August 25th, 2015. And on that day and subsequent days afterward, you would have been able to purchase MasterCard, the quality compounder stock at an average price of about $84 a share. So if we we're gonna use 30% leverage against this portfolio, we would have purchased $30,000 worth of MasterCard. Uh, so 357 shares at $84 a share. And then if we fast forward to today's uh, share price of MasterCard, we'd see that that $30,000 loan, uh, that purchase of MasterCard would now have a profit of $88,408 uh, for basically a 295% return on that very timely purchase. Now let's fast forward to the next occurrence where the VIX was elevated uh, above 35, which was February 5th, 2018. And on this day, we do the same thing. We'd use 30% leverage of our original cost basis of the portfolio, which was $30,000 uh, to buy 185 shares of MasterCard at $162 a share. Now let's take a look at the profitability of that timely one-time purchase. And that $30,000 purchase would now 
based on today's share price, have a profit of $31,301 uh, for a total return on that purchase of 104%. And let's go to the third occurrence where the VIX was elevated above 35, and that was December 24th, 2018. And again, we would take that $30,000 or 30% leverage of our original cost basis to buy 173 shares of MasterCard at a price of $173 a share. And then if we fast forward to today's closing price of MasterCard, uh, that one-time purchase, we would have a profit of $27,551 uh, for a 92% gain on that one-time purchase. And now we go to the final occurrence where the VIX stayed elevated. And this was a time where it actually stayed elevated and peaked at 84. And this is an extremely rare occurrence in the stock market. And considering the challenges that the world was going through at that time, it's not surprising that it got that high. So when there's extreme fear in the market, we need to be prepared with a plan uh, to use additional resources as the VIX spikes and stocks fall even further. Now this is going to take an incredible amount of emotional fortitude because at that moment it seems like the world financial markets are about to collapse. But the fact of the matter is, is during this period of time, MasterCard traded as low as $200 a share uh, when the VIX hit 84. So we need to be prepared to continue to buy stocks as they go lower, especially quality compounder stocks. So over this period of time, we'd have used 40% total leverage based on our original cost basis, which was $40,000 to buy 167 shares at an average cost of $240 a share. Share. And if we fast forward to today's closing price of MasterCard, uh, that $40,000 purchase would have a profit of $15,297, and that would be a 38% return on that one-time purchase. So now that we're here today in the present, which is September of 2020, let's look back and see how the quality compounder method's performance stacked up against an index investor. So for this example, we started off with a $100,000 portfolio invested in the SPY on August 25th, 2015, uh, where we purchased 588 shares of the SPY. And since our initial investment, we would have dollar cost average into the SPY, purchasing an additional two shares every month until today, accumulating a total of 710 shares. So our total cost basis for those 710 shares is about 130,000. And based on today's closing price, that portfolio would be worth uh, $233,000. And the total return for the index investor would be 179%. Now, when we take a look at the quality compounder portfolio, we can see that based on the four specific actions that we took based on the rules of the quality compounder method, based on today's closing price, that portfolio would be worth about $396,000. And the total return for the quality compounder uh, portfolio would be 304%. So that's a $162,000 or 125% worth of outperformance by the quality compounder method versus the, the uh, index investor. And you would have only had to make four uh, timely and guided investment decisions over that five-year period of time. And the reason we were able to do that is that we had a process in place, and that process being the quality compounder method. And that process, it forced us to be patient. And that patience ensured that we would only be making decisions when the probabilities are in our favor. And that's the way we're going to get the quality compounder stock at great prices. And really quick, just because I consider MasterCard a quality compounder stock doesn't mean anyone should go out and buy it today because as you can see here on this chart, MasterCard in my opinion is generally overpriced. Uh, but just like those four moments we went over in this video, there's going to be a day where the market gives us an opportunity uh, to buy the quality compounder stock at more favorable prices. So now that we've gone over the five characteristics that I look for when I'm searching for a quality compounder stock, and now that you have a better understanding of the signs that the market gives us and when we would want to purchase it, my question for you is, is this a system that you think you can follow? Or do you want to continue down the path of an index investor and miss out on these life-changing returns? Or are you interested in discovering more stocks that fit the profile of a quality compounder? Founder. If so, then please like this video and subscribe to the channel. And in the comments below, tell me what stocks do you think have the characteristics of a quality compounder? And I'll do a video just like this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video where I'll look to see if Apple fits the characteristics of a quality compounder. I hope you all have a great day, and I'll see you in the next video.